I suppose we move on to tonight's entertainment item. Um, in August 1972, the Australian Association of Railway Enthusiasts ran a two-week, two, three-week tours to Java, Madura and Sumatra. At the time, Indonesia was alive with an amazing variety of steam locomotives. Frank Stanford was on, uh, on the first of these and will present photographs and commentary on some of the highlights of the extensive tour. I've seen bits and pieces of this over the years, and uh, but it was uh, I was a bit too young at the time to go on any of those. Uh, subjects covered will include Surabaya steam tram, other steam trams, Sipu uh, forestry railway locomotives, Malays in the mountains, Ambarawa railway, elderly and odd locomotives, West Sumatran rack railway, oil palm railways, North Sumatra railways, and others. Just so much of it, you can't list them all. Anyway, I'll hand you over to Frank Stanford. Please uh, show your appreciation. Give Frank a wave. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, I shall go straight into the presentation. Okay, so this was probably the first um, of a whole series of international trips by rail fans to Indonesia, and the Association of Railway Enthusiasts ran two trips in 1972, one week apart, and they each spent three weeks in Indonesia. And briefly on this map, the areas covered were all of, well, most of Java between Jakarta and Surabaya, West Sumatra and North Sumatra. Significant areas that we didn't cover were at Jay up there. South Sumatra and the far west and far east of Java. But we covered all the most important highlights and we also covered a small tramway in Majura. Looking a little more closely at Java, we travelled from Jakarta by the new main line, that's the 1906 main line, down to Bandung and along the south coast and around here up to Surabaya, across to Madura, and then back by the Night Express, the Bima, to Jakarta. Then we went back to travel on a 600 millimetre gauge line there. And then we went off to West Sumatra. Looking more closely at West Java, we travelled from Jakarta to Bandung initially via Purwakarta. And the important thing about this area is the Parahangian Mountains, which are a big barrier to uh, railway building between Purwakarta and Padalarang. And that map doesn't show all the curves and so forth in that stretch of track. And it was that stretch of track that led to all the malaise uh, being built for Indonesia. From Bandung, we went down here, down a branch to Chikajang behind 2660 Malay tanks, and down this way to Banjar behind a DD-52-2880 Malay, and then we went off into central Java. 
now we'll go into malaise in the mountains and the first malaise that was supplied to indonesia were these bb10 class 0442 tanks and they were built in several batches 16 of them between 1900 and 1908 Unfortunately, in 1972, we didn't see any running. I did see two running in 1968, and this is a picture I took in 1968. But strange things happened in Indonesia, and subsequent, subsequently, people visiting later in the 70s did see some of these rather nice locomotives running. So then we go to the next uh, type of Malay that were delivered to Indonesia, the 2660 tanks. And there were, there were 34 of these delivered between 1904 and 1911. And they weighed 63 and a half tonnes and they had an eight and a half ton axle load, which is fairly light. And there's a very interesting and strange feature about these, which I only discovered this week. And that is that the water tank is not one solid water tank, it's two water tanks. That one is attached to the back frame. And this one is attached to the front frame and there's a sort of an overlap of the uh, front water tank there with the back water tank. Now, the result of that is there's this space between the water tank and the boiler because the water tank swings with the curves and the boiler doesn't. So we travelled behind two of these down the Chibatu Chikajang branch. And this is at the terminus at Chikajang. I think the maximum gradient on that line is 1 in 25 or 4%. So we went There's the two CC30s that hauled our train at Chikajang. These two locos came from different batches. This is a later one, and it's got a uh, sloping front on the tank, whereas this one has a straight tank. And also the boiler in that one is slightly higher. That's a uh, station, an intermediate station on that branch. And the branch line had obviously seen better days. And that's the same train crossing a bridge. That was a fairly long trip. And we came back in darkness. We were in this carriage and it's a third class carriage that had a table right down the middle and seats running along the sides. And um, when it got dark, the Indonesian officials brought candles and stuck these candles along the uh, central table. So we were lit by candlelight traveling in the dark and we all broke out singing Walsing Matilda, which was a rather strange and memorable thing to do. And prior to that was a fairly hot day and the Indonesian officials were continually bringing us green tea, which I don't know whether you've ever tried Indonesian green tea, but it's a perfect refresher in that environment.
So then we went on to East Java and amongst other things, we visited the Majun workshops where we saw one of the next class of Malay locomotives supplied to Indonesia, the DD-51s built by Alco in 1919. And this one is obviously out of use. There were uh, 12 built and they were built for heavy freights with a maximum speed of 40 kilometres an hour. And they weighed 143 tonnes, including the tender. And that's interesting for a 2880 Malay, which looks huge. But if you compare that to a South African 25 NC class 484, the South African 484s were well over 200 tonnes. So these are not particularly big. They had bar frames, which apparently caused some trouble. I think they might have been built fairly light for the Indonesian 12-ton axle loading. So they were followed by the DD-52 class 2880 Malays, which we see here on the way between Banja and between Tasik Malaya and Banja in East Java, in West Java, places Lebekiro. And these were built in Germany in 1923. There were 10 altogether, and they had. Uh, plate frames, not bar frames. The dimensions were pretty much the same as the Alcos, but these were much preferred to the Alcos. That's the same train at Lele. And as was frequently the case, lots of children around being entertained by the sight of strange foreigners with cameras. That's a close up of the DD 52s. DD 52. That's waiting to cross a, uh, a long distance train. Same loco, the same place. It's low, high pressure cylinders there and low pressure cylinders there. And these were, they were superheated as well as being compounds. And the next class of, um, Malay and the last class delivered to Indonesia were the 2660s of the CC50 class. And this one is at Majun uh, with a interesting contrast, a sharp Stuart B50 240 of 1880 behind it. The CC15s were there was 30 in the class they were lighter than, and faster than the 2880s they were allowed 55 kilometers an hour and although they were mainly intended for freight they were also used on passenger trains there's two of them at ambarawa one there and one there and Ambarawa was mostly noted for 042 rack tank locos, which we'll see later. There's one of them there. And there's another CC50 close up. This picture I took in 1968 at Purwakarta. These were oil burners. And 
at oil burning depots of in in, in ja, Java, there tended to be a lot of messy oil floating around, which wasn't terribly attractive. <clears throat> so now we're going to have a look at the Yogyakarta Magalang branch. And this is a C24262 tank built by Virkspoor, a Dutch company, in 1911 at Baran, north of Yogyakarta. This was a branch line and it was um, it was built by a tramway company. So it was officially a tramway, but there were lots of tramway companies, steam tramway companies in Java, and some of them outgrew themselves and became first class railways, but they were still called tramway companies. That's the same loco. And again, and that's further up the line at a place called Sleeman. This line has since closed and there's a, uh, the road has been widened and takes up most of the formation, I think. Those st some of the stations still remain, the buildings. That's not a very good picture, but that's the same train. But it shows the type of uh, accommodation that they put on the branch lines, just very simple four-wheel carriages. And that green and cream colour scheme for the carriages dates back to the 1930s into the Dutch era. And that's the same train from the taken from the road. So I mentioned the Ambarawa Rack Railway. This is a uh, close up of one of the 042 tank locos used on the Ambarawa Rack Railway. There were five of this class of loco. And there's two more of them at Ambarawa Loco Shed. Uh, hiding in the shed behind it is a B25, no, a C24 class 262 tank. So that's the start of the rack on the Ambarawa Rack Railway. It's a Riggenbach rack, which is a ladder rack, unlike the uh, toothed rack, which is the rack used on the Mount Lyle Railway. That's the Ab Mount Lyle system as the apt system. There you can see the Riggenbach rack more clearly there. And the loco is pushing the train up the hill. Loco is always on the downhill side of the train so that there wouldn't be runaways in case the train decoupled from the loco. Okay, we're going into East Java and just want to look at my notes. Already mentioned Majun, which is there where the loco workshops are. Pare there is an important location because it was uh, a nest of um, 
an amazing place, a nest of steam tramway locos. And this map is simplified. There was a lot of branches around RA, which used tramway, steam tram locomotives. Um, we went up to Surabaya, the second largest city in Java. And at Surabaya, there was the Surabaya steam tram, which we'll see, which went up to about that point there. And then there's a ferry across to Kamal in Madura. And the two railways in Madura were actually built by tramway companies. We travelled from Kamal to Bunkalan, and we didn't travel on that long line there because it had been infested by diesels. This one was purely steam. Uh, and I'll mention Curtisono if I can find it. Yes, Curtisono is there. That was important in so far as it was the only place that I saw a Javanic or a 2122 tank loco in steam. The Javanics also operated down this way at Clackar, uh, I think, and down at Malang but we didn't have time to go there. It was either a matter of looking at steam trams or looking at 212.2 Jarvenix. So I said Paré was an amazing place with a nest of steam trams, and this is at Paré. It's just amazing that these things were still running in 1972. It's a B-17 class Hohenzollern of Germany, built in 1897. The one and only B-26 class, built in 1908 by Henschel. Another B-15 class inside the shed. And another B-15 class here, built in 1896. All these locos were O4Os and they all had inside cylinders. I think these are water tanks on the outside. And that one weighed 16 tonnes and the others weighed 20 tonnes. Which is interesting because 20 tonnes means a 10 tonne axle load. And that's quite heavy for a tramway. But apparently they were using rails of about 50 pounds or 25 kilogram per metre weight because it was the easiest to get. It was the standard that was being used by the, uh, the Indonesian State Railways, the um, Netherlands Indies State Railways. But the first steam tram locos to be provided to Java were by a Peacock 040 tanks. Um, this one is of 1884, and this is in Majun workshops undergoing maintenance. There are around about 46 of these built. So they must have been pretty good. And there were five still working in 1970. And there's another B-15 class at uh, Paré. That's the fuel supply. Lots of um, steam locomotives in Java burnt wood. Apparently, this particular wood had a very high calorific value. And coal was expensive in Java. There was no local coal supply. I was told the wood was teak. 
and apparently it grew pretty quickly. It's another view of a B-15 tram locomotive with a B-17 behind it. And another B-15 at Paré engine shed. First sight, it looks like these are cylinders, but they're not. They're, they're both fore and aft. Cylinders are inside. I think the reason why they preferred having inside cylinders on the steam tram locos was that it helped hide all the machinery and therefore not so frightening to horses. It's a B a B seventeen class. And the one and only B twenty six, which was lighter than the others, about sixteen tons. And as steam tram locomotives went in, in, in Java, these, these C25 class were unusual, very unusual. They were um, six coupled instead of four coupled. They had outside cylinders and Walshart's valve gear. And they were superheated. They were quite modern, um, built in 1921, that one. That was the yard shunter at Majun Workshops. And you can see the load of teak or firewood there. Now we go to the Surabaya steam tram, which was fairly famous. They painted these locos blue the following year, but um, they were black in 1972. The, there used to be an electric tramway system in Surabaya, but the steam tram outlived it. That's actually track of the electric tram there. I didn't know that until a, uh, an Indonesian railway enthusiast pointed it out to me when I published this on a Facebook group. So the, the station is Kevin Rojo. And that's a B-12 class similar to the Bayer Peacocks, but this one was built by the Dutch Werkspoor Company in 1903. That's the same loco near Kalimis, which is the the port for Madura. But somewhere along the way, and uh, an Indonesian railway enthusiast identified the exact location and said that it was in front of the zoo. And the same person identified the precise location of that, Jalan Bungaran number 49. Those buildings are still there. Steam tramway finished up in about 1979, I think. It did create a lot of um, interference with uh, local commerce in the narrow streets. So from that steam tramway, we went on a 12-kilometre ferry ride to Madura Island. And at Madura Island, there was Kamal Loco Depot, where we had this D-16 class 080 tank, which was going to haul our 
train and the C26 class 060 tank and the D16s were unique to Madura Island. There are 11 in that class and it was originally a private tramway company that ran the um, the railways on Madura Island. And there's an 080 diesel hydraulic loco lurking in the uh, engine shed there that was used on the long line to the east in Madura. That's another of the C26 class 060 tanks at Madura and something else behind it. Not sure what that is. One of the strange items of rolling stock on the Madura Railway was the Sultan of Madura's personal inspection vehicle, which was attached to the train that we travelled on. And that vehicle has since been preserved, I'm pleased to say. There's the train we travelled on it on. And that's at the, near the northern terminus at Bankalan. It's at the town square. And that's probably the terminus at Bankalan. Don't know what all these were used for. And on the return trip at Tilang Station, the second stop from Kamal. Okay, we're now having a look at Central Java. And here, places of interest, a mouse, where we'll see a little O4O loco being used for pumping water. Uh, Yogyakarta there, the, the spellings of these place names were as they were in 1969. I, I prepared these maps in 1969. That branch line that we saw quite early went up there to uh, Baran and Sleeman and beyond up to there. And there's Ambarawa up there. And we're going to see Chepu and a branch line train to Blora. Uh, Bojanagoro. We'll see the loco depot there with um, 3440 express passenger logos of ancient or old vintage. How many people would be So that dotted line there is the border between Central Java and East Java. And that dotted line there is a border between Central Java and West Java. The railway administration was divided up into three, West, Central and East, and so was the administration of the island. So I mentioned the Chepu Blora branch and his branch line train about to leave Chepu for Blora with uh, very interesting locomotive, I think. So we'll have a look at that. 
it's a, a 260 tank and it's a comp two cylinder compound on the German von Bory system. There were 83 of these originally built and they were built for mainline use over the mountains. And they were built from 1879 to 1891. And trains got too heavy for them and they were their job were taken over by Malays, but they were very uh, effective locomotives and they went into more local service after that. And you can see that's a, a wood burner. This is just a view from Chepu station at more or less the same location looking in the other direction. There's an unidentified steam loco there and two C28464 tank locos there. And these were all built in 1921, the C28 class. And they were very good apparently. There were 58 built. They were very popular and worked all over Java. They were apparently built for suburban service and they weighed 78 and a half tonnes, so quite big locos. That's the same weight as the Jarvanic 2122 tanks, which we'll see later. So there's that Chepu Blora train out along the way running down the side of the main street and uh, that line was also built by one of the private tramway companies that's the same train departing from Chepu Chepu station is down that way and the actual track layout of all the railways around Chepu was quite complicated and there were there were two stations in Chepu there was the main Netherlands East Indies station and there was a tramway station and in addition to that there were industrial sidings and this is a uh, Netherlands Indies, former Netherlands Indies line going into industrial sidings over here. And also at Chepu was the Chepu Forestry Railway, which was a very big operation at one time. It had a large mileage. It had five of these O10O tank locos. They're quite a lightweight tank loco. This one was called Mad Joe, which means progress. And there's a jack shaft there, which helps control the, um, the side play in the rear axle there. So far, all the, all the railways we've seen have been three foot six gauge or 1067 1, millimeter gauge. And also on the same forestry railway was this A60 tank Ducru and Brauns, one of the last locomotives built by this Dutch company in 1950. So that was supplied after Indonesia had gained its independence in 1949. 
the um, Chepu Forestry Railway supplied the Indonesian State Railways with firewood for their locos. But at one stage in the 1950s, the uh, Indonesian State Railways were so short of funds, they couldn't pay the Chepu Forestry Company for the firewood that was being supplied. And that was because um, of a, a weak economy in, Ind <coughs> in Indonesia. Unfortunately, the, um, the president of Indonesia at that time, Mr. Sukarno, uh, had um, no knowledge of economics and uh, caused a lot of problems for the country. Hence, the state railways paid the forestry company for the firewood they supplied instead of with money, with old locomotives. And this is one of the old locomotives they supplied, an XPNKA, that's the Indonesian State Railways, A6O tank Hanamag of 1922. And that's another one they supplied, one of the uh, C25 A6O tank tram locomotives, obviously out of service. And this thing in front of it is very, very interesting. And that's, it's a pity it's in bits without a boiler, great pity. It, um, it's a very rare beast indeed. It's an 080 tank with a two-speed geared drive. It was built by Orenstein and Koppel uh, either in 1912 or sometime between 1914 and 1920. There weren't too many of these locos built. Anyway, one of the driving axles is there, the second one is there, the third one is there, the fourth one is there. It's probably got clean Linna hollow axles, which means that that axle and that axle can swing from side to side. There's a jack shaft there and another jack shaft above it. And the cylinders are there, which drove onto the top jack shaft. So there were gears between the top and the bottom check shaft, enabling two-speed operation. Now, another interesting thing is that the first two locomotives that the forestry line owned were Class A Climaxes, which were eight-wheel, two bogies, and had two-speed operation. So these came only a few years after the A-class climax. And I think this might be a sort of a German answer to the A-class climax two-speed loco. Far more, um, far more technically complicated than the climax. Okay, now we're going into the elderly and odd locomotive um, group. And uh, this one falls into the odd class. It's an 040 tender loco. And 040 tender locos are pretty rare. I can't identify that particular loco, but it's at Mouse on the Sarayu River and it's pumping water. Now, this is a close-up of the same class of loco. Very interesting wheel arrangement for a, a loco that's um, used out on sort of the main lines. There were... There were... Fifth, oh, no, there were 27 of these built. And they must have been successful 
because they came in four batches from 1908 to 1913. And there were still 15 in service in 1970. The maximum speed was 45 kilometres an hour. They were used by one of the steam tramway companies. And I've seen pictures of them in use in the 1920s and 1930s. And they have quite long trains behind them, about 15 vehicles. Now this one falls into the elderly group. It's taken under great difficulty in confined space. And my wide angle lens wasn't wide enough to get the whole loco in in one piece. So that's the front and that's the rest of it. It's a Bio Peacock 240 tank. This one was built in 1898. But the reason it's interesting is that it's almost identical to the very first three foot six inch gauge loco supplied to Java in 1871 by Bayer Peacock. And uh, there's no side play on the front wheels, it's all rigid, and the cylinders are horizontal. It's quite different to the 248 tanks that by a peacock had supplied to Norway from 1866, which were a revolutionary breakthrough as far as three foot six locos were going. But um, these were simpler than the Norwegian ones without any front bristle track, and they were suitable for Indonesia for Java because the line they were running on from Jakarta south to Bogor didn't have lots of curves. Then we see another type of 240 tank, and this is a German one, built by Hannah Mag in 1885 at Modjakerto in East Java, and uh, there are 11 built in this class. They were allowed 60 kilometres an hour and they were used for passenger trains. I think by 1972, this was being used for shunting, probably, I'm not sure. Then one of the amazing um, survivors were the Sharp Stewart B50 class 240s. This one built in 1880, and that's at Majun in East Java. There were um, there were 65 originally built. And 14 were still active in 1972. And they were the first mainline passenger engines for Java, the first express engines. But at the time they were built, they were allowed 60 kilometers an hour. So they weren't um, running high speed expresses in, in the 1880s. They were used, still being used for local work in 19 into the 1970s. And that's a little O4A tank at Modjakerto in East Java, used for shunting. And another little O4A tank at Pare, East Java, that was used along with the steam uh, tram engines. Then we go to Bojanagoro, that loco shed there, which had 
quite a lot of these uh, 440s, the B51 class, which were two cylinder compounds, and the later version, the B53 class, which were two cylinder simples with superheating. So these, uh, it's dated from 1912 to 1914. These, the B51s, were built between 1900 and, 1900 and 1912, and there were 44 of them. And all of these were allowed 80 kilometres an hour on express passenger service. That's the high pressure, that's the low pressure cylinder there, much bigger than the high pressure cylinder there. And that's the fuel for all these locos. And that's a close up of one of the B51s with the big low pressure cylinder there. And at Bojanagoro, they looked after the appearance of their locos very well. And this is definitely odd. This is an 060 tank with inside frames at the front and outside Stevenson valve gear and outside frames at the back to accommodate a wider firebox. And that's obviously derelict at Sidotopo in East Java. This also falls into the odd category, I think. It's an 062 tank with inside cylinders and outside skirt water tanks, skirt tanks. And it's got an auxiliary tender there for water. That was built for one of the local steam tramway companies. Now, this one goes into the odd category. It's one of the famous Jarvanix 2122 tanks. And this one's out of service at Majun Loco Workshops. And there were there were uh, yeah, twenty eight were built in several batches between nineteen fourteen and nineteen twenty. They were allowed 75 kilometres an hour and they weighed 78 and a half tonnes. There was some side play on the rear drivers and some side play on the front drivers. And they were originally intended to do the same jobs as the CC10-2660 Malay tanks though these were a bit heavier. And the problem with the seas, with all the Malays was maintaining tight um, steam joints for the front, uh, front um, engine unit due to the flexible steam joints. I only saw one of these in use, and there it is at uh, Curtisono. Just there, there's a vertical hinge in the coupling rod to allow for the side play on that axle. 
And there's a vertical hinge also in the coupling rod there for the side play on that axle. These things have got T-shaped water tanks. You can see the outside of them there and they go down between the frames to give a low uh, center of gravity. On the whole, these locos were quite successful on um, on not too uh, curvy, um, uh, steeply graded lines. On steeply graded lines that weren't too curvy. Uh, on sharply curved lines, it turned out that the um, they could cope with them, but the wear on the flanges of the uh, leading and trailing driving wheels was very high. Now I'm putting this one in the odd category too, because so a, a rare beast. This is a Pacific, a 462, a so-called super Pacific. It was a four-cylinder compound out of use at Majun by 1972. It's got what was called a wind cutter cab too, coming forward to a V-shape there. These were used on the express train between Surabaya and Jakarta. And that train was running, had the uh, world speed record for three foot six inch gauge trains in the 1930s. It was doing the trip between Surabaya and Jakarta in the about 11 and a half hours or over 800 kilometer journey. And in places, in places these things uh, went at 100 kilometers an hour easily with 300 or 400 ton trains. And they were also known to get up to 125 kilometers an hour. However, with inside cylinders, as well as outside cylinders, they were very complicated and didn't, they, they lost their popularity when um, later simpler engines became available. Okay, now we went to the uh, 600 millimeter gauge line at Karawang in West Java, where our train was hauled by this 080 tank, which was built by the Dutch Werkspoor Company in 1926, same year as G42 in for Victorian Railways. That's another view of this loco. And there it is somewhere else out along the line. I think they might be lifting water from there into the tanks. Okay, beyond the PNKA or beyond the Indonesian State Railways, there were lots of sugar tramways in East Java, but I don't believe we saw any of the steam-operated ones. At, at that stage in 1972, we didn't have the information to find them. However, we did see this animal-powered sugar tramway. And there it is, another view. This was probably probably 700 millimeter gauge, about two feet four. And we also saw this forestry tramway. It might be standard gauge or it might be three foot six, I'm not sure. I think it was animal powered. 
and it seems to be crossing a three foot six inch gauge line there. And looking the other way, that's the uh, forestry tramway. It's probably animal powered, pretty rough, very light. And there's some of the local traffic along the, that's along the Chepu Blora Railway. And this is a busy street, I think in um, a narrow street in, I think it's in Jakarta. And that's some of our party traveling in one of the Betchaks, the tricycle rickshaws. And I'm in a Betchak behind them. So I took this photograph from a Betchak. It might actually be the street where we, uh, our hotel in Jakarta was located because I remember our hotel was located in a street which didn't look very, um, very attractive, but the hotel itself was pretty good. And there's another one of our party traveling there. You can see his camera strapped there, uh, traveling somewhere in Java. And so now we'll have a look at some of the railways around Jakarta itself. There used to be an, an electric suburban system and an electric system from Jakarta to the uh, governors, the, the um, town of Bogor to the south of Jakarta. Bogor was where the uh, governor lived in the time of the Dutch occupation. And they they had three different types of electric locos which they used on the Bogor line. By 1972, they were still being used around Jakarta, but apparently only for shunting. So this is one of them. It's a one bow bow one. They dated from the nineteen about 1925. And here's another type of about the same vintage. That's a one do one. And these were the first mainline diesels to be provided to the railways in Java. It's an Alco GE of 1953, and the wheel arrangement is rather strange. It's a co to co, and the middle bogey was supplied to uh, lower the total axle loading. Okay, now I think we're heading off, not quite yet. That's the old workshops at Jakarta at a place called Mangarai. They were a very well equipped and very busy workshops in the uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. And there was a traverser that ran right down that full length. But by 1972, they seemed to be completely out of service. I think that's the power supply for the Traverser going along there. So then we went off to um, West Sumatra in a Garuda Fokker Fellowship F28. And this is at Padang, West Sumatra. Where we had a welcoming party of the locals at Padang Station. There's one reading the paper. D 
this these very strange and rather ungainly looking 260 tanks were used on the uh, more level bits of the West Sumatran Railway. And they, um, they dated from, 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 eighteen ninety three, eighteen ninety two, uh, to nineteen hundred and four. Uh, they were in service from eighteen ninety two. That one was built in eighteen ninety one. There were 14 still in service in 1970 and 24 had originally been built. The um, West Sumatran Railway was built almost entirely for the purpose of getting coal from a coal mine way up in the mountains in a place that was very difficult to access. And this little 060 tank at Padang was used for shunting on the local line to the port. There's one of these C-33 tank locos, and it looks as if it's got another one banking it behind. And three coal hopper wagons. Okay, the interesting feature of the West Sumatra Railway was the rack section. And this is Padang Panjang Loco Shed, which is some considerable distance away from Padang, the port. Uh, yeah, it's 77 kilometres from Padang. And it was the main loco depot for these O10O rack tank locos, of which there were quite a lot. And the last of them, the E10 class they are, was only five years old, built by Nippon Shayo in Japan in 1967. And it's got a geese ejector. And you need to be very careful with Indonesian names. I got confused. There's another place called Padang Panyang with a Y there, not a J. And Padang Panyang is about 200 kilometres to the west of Padang Panjang and nowhere near a railway line. So this is in the Padang Panjang area. And this is one of the Otino rack tanks on the rack, pushing empty coal wagons up towards the mine. And that's another location on the same railway. And this, this one's including passenger accommodation. Well, it's, it's a mixed train, it's not a coal train. Yes, it is. It's got coal wagons as well. And that's turning one of the O10O, the Japanese built O10Os at Kotobaru. And again at the same place. So from West Sumatra, we headed off in one of these Japanese NAMCYS-11s to Medan, and that's at Medan. And there's quite a lot of our, our party coming off the plane there.
and the main station on the North Sumatran Railway was Medan. And just in 1971, they'd received these BB302 Henschel diesel hydraulic locos. So steam wasn't so in evidence as it would have been a couple of years earlier. But there's a steam loco there. The North Sumatran Railway was a bit different to the rest. It was owned by a company called the DLI Spoorweg or DLI Railway Company, Dutch company, and it was privately owned until 1957 when it was nationalised by the Indonesian government. And it wasn't actually taken over by the PNKA until 1963. And the locomotives were never classified in the um, same series as those in Java and West Sumatra. And the DLI Railway Company bought some very, very strange locomotives, such as this high boiler 242. And despite their weird appearance, they were very successful. They weighed 40 tonnes, they were superheated, and there were 10 in the class, fairly modern, 1929. And they had some bigger, more impressive locos, like these 264 tanks. There's quite a lot of these, at least 23, built between 1914 and 1921. And all of these locos in North Sumatra were wood burners. And the biggest of the lot were these 284 tank locos, only one of which was still in service in 1972. That's at Tebing Tingi. So we were very lucky to see that. Quite an impressive looking machine, I think. They were superheated. They were built in 1916 and there were only four built. And there were some other peculiar loco, rather peculiar locos on the DLI railway. These 064 tanks, which is a fairly uncommon wheel arrangement with outside Stevenson valve gear, but they'd been converted to 244 tanks quite early in the piece that was built in 1900 by about 1910 they'd been converted to 244s by the simple process of taking off the uh, leading part of the coupling rod and quite by chance we found this very interesting 600 millimeter gauge ballast quarry tramway at a place called Gunung Kataran near Tebing Tingi in North Sumatra and that's the North Sumatran main line there and this was used to supply ballast to the main line and there's some very nice point work and track work on this tramway not high speed not high speed track And they had a Duke Crew and Braun's 060 tank of 1929. And when the driver of this saw this um, group of strange foreigners suddenly arrive, he lived in a little timber, a little house somewhere around here, more of a like a uh, a, a humble two-roomed hut more than a house but he actually invited us home 
two is two room hut and um he uh had bottles of coca-cola there he had a crate of coca-cola and he um he uh, supplied us all with coca-cola how much it cost him in terms of his uh, wages i don't know but it was a it was an extremely kind gesture and on this quarry tramway there was a um, double track in incline cable worked incline and down at the other end there was another Duke Crew and Braun's O six O tank loco. So finally in North Sumatra there were lots and lots of oil palm railways with lots and lots of locomotives of various interesting designs. And we only saw a uh, a few of these, but this is one of them, an O ten O ten de Loco, Orenstein and Koppel of 1925. And these were 700 millimetre gauge, or about two, two foot four inch. And there's another one, a Duke Crew and Braun's, built in 1940, an 044 tank, obviously not ready to go there because that's disconnected outside frames on the back inside frames on the front and another 0440 tank this one by Orenstein and Koppel of 1920 again with uh, inside frames on the front outside frames on the back oh and then we go to yet another 0440 tank a duke crew and brawns of 1928 so that's come to the end of the journey i've added some details of some major books that i think are worth um following up if you're interested in the subject i won't talk about the text here but you can all check it out once this um once this uh is um available in the recording this narrow gauge in the tropics i think is the best general history of the railways of the Netherlands, of the Dutch East Indies from 1864 to 1942, which was the time of the Japanese occupation. And that's an article that's available um, on the web that I wrote in 1969 about my visit in 1968. And this is a very good book. It's called The Indonesian Railways in Wartime. It's, it's written in Dutch. It's very large pages, over, over A4 size. And although it talks about wartime it actually has a history quite detailed going back to 1873 and lots and lots of very good pictures going back to 1873 and in very good um, very well reproduced now I shall stop sharing the screen and there's one other book that I didn't mention there which is also worth getting hold of if you're interested in industrial steam locomotives and that's this book called Dampf Lokomotiven der Indonesian Werkbahn and Steam Locomotives of Indonesian Industrial Railways. It's a huge book 
on a huge subject, and the author is Uwe Bergman, and it was published about 10 years ago, I think, and well worth having if you're interested in uh, Indonesian industrials. Okay, I shall hand it back to Bill now. All right. Thank you very much, Frank. That was fascinating. It just, it's interesting, the, you know, the the style of the locomotives and that when you're used to, say, a particular area, you know what's good looking to your eye. But as you the, it went on, I started to grow to like the appearance of the locomotives. They weren't so unusual looking to me. So uh, yeah, they grew on me, so to speak. Yeah, that's one of the fascinating things about the uh, railways of Indonesia because we used to railways that had um, English influence and American influence, but there were some British locomotives in Java, but it was uh, highly influenced by um, uh, continental practice. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there was one of the locomotives there. Uh, um, uh, Rob Dickinson put up a little message uh, that said that it was a Lutmiler style. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, um, the two six twos that uh, had the um, outside wheels or the, the front and rear wheels driven through um, drive shafts and um, crown and pinion gears. Yes. Fascinating things. And of course, one of them, those locomotives, is in the UK at the moment, being restored. Is it? That's yeah. good. Yeah. It'll, it, it, yeah, quite fascinating sort of design. All right, who's got some questions for Frank? Um, Frank. Yes. I know you didn't uh, mention this, but I just want to ask a question. It's the Salawesi Island, which is to the north of, um, just trying to get my geography right. Uh, it's to the north. I've been there myself. I've been up to Monado. And it's changed its name now, but the, it was a city, town called Ujung Pangdung on the south of the island. Do you know, did that island ever have a railway system or of any nature, timber or anything else? Yeah. Talking about the Celebes or Sulawesi, it's a strange shaped island with sort of fingers to the right of it. Yeah, it's sort of roughly a, a triangle dome shape at the top where Monado is. And it's the island that got the two volcanoes at the top of that's east of Monado inland. Ah. Uh... I don't know. Um, Hello. I... If you can hear me, the Salibis Sulawesi had a short tramway. Yeah, Salibis uh, definitely did. Sulawesi definitely had a, a short tramway in the 1920s, 1930s. There were plans to build quite restored. a system there, but it didn't talk, happen. Talk about restoring it. I'm talking about really? restoring it. Really? Yeah. And talking of restorations, uh, perhaps most people are not aware that the line from Chibatu to Garut, that's on the way up to Chikijang, has yes. now been remade and reopened. Uh, that's good. Absolutely amazing revival. Yes. Um, that what was line... the line used for? Was it timber? Was it uh, uh, prop, Gen general... prop based? Or which, what was it for? Which, which line are you talking about? Steam tramway that was the gentleman was just talking about this being was being um, renovated or restored. That's a mainline branch. Garut is a major town in the highlands above Bandung. Yeah, that was general. Uh, the, general. Yeah, and uh, and the reason they restored it is because the traffic jams are so bad uh, ah. to get from get from the middle of Bandung to the middle of Garut. It's not too bad in between. But the, the traffic in the towns is absolutely appalling. I can imagine. I can vouch for that. Being there in the uh, the early 1990s, um, 
we have accidents, but I just amazed that it was like organised chaos on the roads over there. Going into Monado, yeah, it's just uh, yeah, they had their own rules. Okay, one other bit of news which may, may have reached you. Last week, they started the high-speed train service from Jakarta to Bandung. Yep, heard about that. It's the, it's the Chinese high-speed line. So next time you're in Java... What gauge is that? that? I think it's standard gauge. Right. Do you know what the uh, timing is between the two cities? It's not very much. It, I, I, you, you, you can find it on the internet. The, the 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 Bandung end is sort of southwest of the city, south east of the city centre. Yeah. But the Jakarta end is well outside the city centre. Oh, is it? Right. So, so it's rather, rather like having to catch a plane. You know, you have to get to the airport first. Here, you have to get out to the the outskirts. It, it doesn't. Well, Jakarta has got just just impossible traffic. I can imagine. Uh, this <laughs> is Rob be, Dickinson speaking, by the way. Yeah, I mean, that used to be one of the nice things about the, the train to Bandung is it went from the middle of Jakarta. In the old days? Yeah, well, until quite recently, yes. Oh, OK. Yeah, yes, that's the three-foot-six gauge one. Absolutely, the, yes. Yes. Yeah, the three-foot... Well, the very first train that I travelled on outside Australia was from Jakarta to Bandung, and I remember that well, that... It uh, re this was in 1968 behind a diesel hydraulic. It went at uh, really fast uh, out of Jakarta, much faster than I think I'd ever travelled on three foot six in Australia. But then once it got up to pull a carter uh, into the mountains, it really uh, slowed down. It was uh, struggling in the on the hills, as the um, as the Malays used to do before it. Well, they've 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 realigned quite a lot of that line up from Purbakata, and okay. most of it is double double, double track to Bandung. Right, but they've missed out very badly because they they've got a, a toll road motorway type system, which runs parallel to it, and of course, a lot, a lot of the passenger traffic has been lost the road. Yes. And I assume now it'll go back back again to, now that they've got the high-speed train. I don't know what the cost is. Yes. Yeah. Well, generally, in, I'm not sure how much the, the change between 68 and 72, but generally in 1968, people preferred to travel by train than by road because the roads were so slow and so bad. Yeah, they've they've modeled, they've, there's been a tremendous amount of modernization of the of, of the Cape Gauge line. So yes. be between Jakarta and Surabaya, I think I'm right in saying it's all all double track now. That's and amazing. reading reports of people people who travel on it uh, is just unrecognizable from we, the time when we went to the 1970s, like you. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm. And there's um there's a very highly active um, local um, interest by railway enthusiasts, uh, including young railway enthusiasts. They're interested in the history. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's at least one journal being published. I've seen some of the work they've done on um, historical research. It's very good. Yeah, but every major city has got a group, a group of enthusiasts, mm. uh, especially Yogyo, Yogyo especially, and Bandung, as, right. you, as you'd expect. Mm. Yeah, uh, just uh, something as a slight aside, but um, back in the late nineteen uh, nineties, uh, I was working with uh, Western Air Signals Australia, and they had a big contract to do resignaling. Uh, of some significant sections of railway in Indonesia. And um, I always remember that uh, we had to, they sent us over copies of their existing circuits on some things, and it was all in Dutch. It would be. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. And there, there was uh, some some of the things uh, that they had there were, uh, were a mixture of sort of Indonesian and Dutch sort of terms. Uh, it was one, one of the objects they had um, in um, level crossings was Long Seng Penjagas, which was an electromechanical device that rung a bell. Um, it was controlled electronically, but it was a, a, like a grandfather clock with the weights in it the, uh, that actually rang the bell that said there was a train coming. Mm. Yeah, no, interesting. Was well, the weird thing about the weird thing about Indonesia is that the they drive on the left on the road, but the railways run on the right. Oh yeah, <laughs> which is the opposite way round to France, where they drive on the right and the railways keep left. Hmm. Oh well. Yeah. Always interesting. No idea why yeah. they drive on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Well. More questions? I have no questions, but I would say he's Gunther from Germany. This was one of the mo most too, too comprehensive uh, presentation ever seen about Indonesia. It's absolute perfect, all in color, so many action shots, really unbelievable, Frank. I'm glad that I do not miss this. Oh, come on. Very and thank you very much, Frank. It's, it was lovely to see these pictures. And the, I think, for me, the highlight was that amazing jack shaft loco at Chepu. Oh, uh, yes, that, that is amazing. I, I'm glad I um, I didn't know what I was taking when I saw that thing, but I thought it might have been important. <laughs> so I photographed you, you, you it. You know that there's, there's a sugar loco with a jack shaft drive near Madiun at Regisari. Yes. That's, a, that's, a, that's an 080. And it survives to this day, and they they they, they kept it in, in working order. But and I suspect it was similar to the one you saw. That wouldn't have been one of the two speed ones, would it? I I, I don't know what you, I don't. I'm not sure what you mean by two speed, but the two speed the, geared the, the, like that that yeah, one. Basically, was... when the, when the top half moves, it moves much quicker than the yes. bottom half. Yes, yeah, so, so I think it's probably, it's probably a similar system. Yeah, but apparently it had a choice of two speeds in operation, mm. like a like I class think, A. I don't think that's, the case. that's not the case for the sugar sugar version. No, I wouldn't have thought so. I think um, they were provided specially for forestry service, presumably on very rough track. Yes. Yeah. I think, Frank, your pictures from Madura is the first time I have ever seen pictures uh, in color. I only know the one picture in PNK Power Parade. Otherwise, your pictures are really total new for me. Absolute stunning. Oh, that's uh, I can tell you, if you go on my website, you'll find more pictures of Madura, rather, rather similar to what Frank has. Yeah, okay. Maybe I... Uh, I have missed this, uh, but I will come back to you. There should be a lot more in existence because I was with a party and there was lots of people with lots of cameras, but um, where their photographic collection is these days, I don't know. <laughs> There's also one good book which I could recommend. I don't know if you see this. The storm tracks uh, here. Ah, yes, that's um, a Dutch book, isn't it? Yeah, Dutch book, yes. It's all in Dutch, uh, difficult. But for example, I found uh, that all is the it, Pacific before still in is it, is it still available? Well, you, you have to, for example, you could go on uh, uh, Euro, uh, Euro books, which is mean uh, SFB point AT, and there is, you can maybe get it. You I, I, I put put the link in in the chat. Yes, please. I want to get a copy of that. I didn't think it was available. Yeah, yeah it's well worth it. Really... Oh, I can imagine. It was published in nineteen eighty two, so you'll oh, it will be scarce. Oh, okay. I want 
at least twenty uh, percent uh, of all my books uh, I got. I have what more than one thousand books, and uh, I got it from uh, this uh, link, so this Euro books, and you, know, you can even uh, set a um, where I say a marking, and then for one year they inform you if the book which you are looking for will uh, appear. So it's well oh, worth. Oh, I see. Yes. Hmm. Right, any more comments or questions? I, th I think you've satisfied everybody, Frank. <laughs> well, I think he's absolutely well, well satisfied. <laughs> oh, very interesting program, Matt. Yeah. Some, yeah. Somebody asked um, when the C-53 class or where the C-53 class. I'm just looking through the comments, the chat. Um, uh, this, they were all built by Workspore uh, because Germany could not do uh, this. Between 1917 and 1922, all uh, 30 right. were built by the Dutch factory. Uh-huh. Right. But they probably got lots of parts from Germany, I think. Maybe. <laughs> I th I think so. According to that um that book I mentioned uh this one um narrow gauge in the tropics Vexpor was getting lots of their parts from Germany. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. You're all happy? Yes. 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 Can, Thanks, can we continue Frank. for another hour? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's left. How many uh, pictures do you have still, Frank? <laughs> No. All right. I don't think Frank's got any more ready tonight. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Mike, you'll have to unmute yourself. Mm. He's probably watching the cricket. <laughs> What's that? Sorry, it's uh, sorry. I just want to interrupt for a moment, Bill, if you wouldn't mind. You can go through it. Um, well, people are thinking up anything else they want to ask of Frank. Um, Ross Sadler's presentation of two months ago, uh, those of you who um, may have looked at the recording of the presentation post the meeting um, would have noted that a lot of the videos didn't have sound attached to them. Um, something technical happened. I don't know where, but anyway... The, um, since then, Ross has very kindly re-recorded that presentation. And um, by the end of tonight, it will be up available on the recorded presentations um, site on, you know, on the LWSA uh, website. So uh, you, you'll get the full benefit of um, everything that Ross intended to broadcast that night. And uh, before I get out of the way again, the uh, next uh, presentation will be from um, David Jean, um, and uh, he will be speaking on as I hunt around for it. Um, here we go. Can't hear you, Mike. <laughs> uh, yeah. We didn't hear you, Mike. You're, You're muted, muted yourself, Mike. Oh, I was, sorry. I was, I was pressing the space bar as per instructions from the guy at the start. and um, You it, muted it, yourself by pressing the space bar, I think. <laughs> well, I get to repeat. <laughs> what did I say? Um, 
the uh, look sorry about that i didn't i thought i was everybody could hear what i was saying but not true uh look i just, sorry bill i just wanted to interrupt while people yeah, no are thinking worries. about more things to ask of frank the um last presentation uh was by ross sadler uh also it's on uh, uh, indonesian focused and um there was an issue that the a lot of the the sound didn't come through from from Ross's presentation in terms of his videos, but Ross has very kindly re-recorded that presentation, and by the end of tonight, it will be available on our website for people to enjoy. So, uh, if you want to hear the full benefit of the, the sound coming through on all those wonderful uh, New Zealand light line, uh, not New Zealand, those Indonesian light lines, uh, then you can go to the site and and enjoy them. And just finally, before I get out of the way, uh, the next meeting. Uh, in two months' time, will be presented by David Jean, and he'll be presenting on the Clyde Engineering Company. So, um, anyway, that's what I, I was trying to say before, but didn't go through. Sorry about that, and I'll now get out of your way. No, no problem. Thanks for that uh, <laughs> update, Mike. Yeah, very good. Um, if nobody's got anything else to say, I think it's time to uh, say good night to you all. Um, has anyone got anything else? No, I think that's just, it. Just to say thanks from mm -hmm. Les. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Right down under excellent. Is top presentation, yeah. Frank. Most interesting. Yeah. We always talk about our hair in England as Australia as being down under. Do you talk up about us as being up over? No, no, you're really. down under. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, very good. All right, then. Um, I'll say good night to you all and uh, uh, and hope you all uh, have a, a wonderful week, what's left of it, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next time in two months' time. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Excellent. Good night from Brisbane. Well done. What's the time? Quarter seven. Oh, we doing it. Oh, which is the same time we started yesterday. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll get to do an hour of work. Well done, mate. I I'll, I'll be, it certainly was well worth getting up. It's interesting. Thanks.